Welcome to the No Quit Living Podcast. Our primary objective is to motivate and inspire our listeners to never quit. The reality of life is simple. We all fall. We all fail. At times, we get knocked down. The question is, do we get back up? Are we stronger? Are we better prepared to attain the maximum of our potential? Thank you for joining our No Quit Tribe. As you go for your greatness today, never quit. And remember, we rise by lifting others up. Welcome to episode number 388 of the No Quit Living Podcast. I'm your host, Christopher J. Worth, and today's theme of the day is the storms of life. Our quote of the day comes to us from Bart Millard. The storms of life make you either better or bitter. As we are heading into the winter season, if you are looking for a book for your team with a positive spin about culture, we would love it if you checked out our new book, The Positivity Tribe in the Locker Room. You can head on over to Amazon or wherever else you get your books. If you're looking for any more information, you can head on over to thepositivitytribe.com. It is an honor to welcome back today's guest for her second appearance on our show. I've really enjoyed getting to connect with Eric Wood, and I'm honored to be able to call him a friend. I hope you enjoy today's episode. Eric, I'd like to welcome you back to the No Quit Living podcast. Chris, it's an honor, brother. I had a ton of uh, fun of the last one, excited. This one's on video, excited to to see you developing this and, and continuing to grow it. I appreciate it. We've we talked last time, but we've obviously both had very similar guests on the show, which is kind of cool. I've I've gone back and listened to to a bunch of years. And I think in the past maybe three or four weeks, if not more, you've had Alan Stein Jr. on and he was one of the I think first fifteen or twenty on mine, and I love his his Kobe story. I've actually shared it probably with 20 or 30 of the college sports teams I'm working with. And I think everybody just, they're, they're always enamored by the simplicity of that story he shares. Yeah, no doubt about it. It's amazing. Um, how much, how many Kobe stories are circulating now that he's passed. And I say that in a good way, you know, he was a guy that he lived in the spotlight, but so much what he did was out of the spotlight and not necessarily talked about. And once he passed, people just felt the need to honor him and his work ethic and what he did that was never, as Alan Stein would say, was unseen. And so to honor him, so many have shared those stories and it's remarkable what type of effort that guy put in on a daily basis. You know, it's 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 neat that you just just said that because I was having a conversation with a friend of mine that goes to the same gym that I go to, and he's a he's a big Kobe guy, and we just started talking about social media and how everybody is sharing everything and how everybody puts their workouts, and I'm I'm guilty of that as well. I do it more from the accountability uh, perspective of to myself from myself. But he was saying to me, he said, if Kobe was alive today and playing today. He said, you know, he'd probably have an Instagram account or something for for Nike and his camps and the charities that he does. But he said, I don't think he'd post a single picture or post of, hey, just got finished with my 3 a.m. workout. Because to your point, he's he's doing it all in the unseen hours. And that's what I love about uh, Alan's story that I shared. I also don't think he would want anyone knowing his routine to be able to imitate it as well. And it may have worked to his advantage if people did try to imitate him because they would ran or they would have run themselves into the ground trying to keep up with him as an absolute machine of human being uh, with his work ethic. I say that in a complimentary way, just the way that he worked likely would have driven so many into the ground. And so, uh, but you're right. I don't think you would have seen Kobe's workouts. It would have looked like a number of professional athletes, social media accounts nowadays, where you don't see the workouts, you see ads, you see some family stuff, you'll see some wife or kids honoring posts, maybe some um, specific branded um pregame stuff that's professionally made that's put out through a social media team so they don't have to deal with it but i think you're spot on there so jumping into this episode on your last appearance you said something that i want to dissect real quick you said in life people are either in a storm coming out of a storm or heading into a storm could you touch on that for a second yeah that's that's one of my favorite quotes 
Um, I heard it first from a, a buddy of mine, Chris Morgan, who runs UVL FCA, uh, the second biggest FCA group, Fellowship of Christian Athletes group in the country. Over 300 student athletes at the University of Louisville come per week to hear the messaging. And, you know, they may come for the Chick-fil-A sandwiches, but they get to hear the word, an inspirational message each week. And so I originally heard it from Chris. And each of us in life, it's important to understand that we all have storms in life that can help you be compassionate with others. You have no idea what someone's going through. But if you're in that easy stretch of life, that stretch of life where everything seems to be going smoothly, just understand that there will be storms in life that are coming. And by storms, I mean adversity. And it could look as, ex as extreme as a, a death of a family member. It could be as small as someone cutting you off in traffic that that puts you in some type of rage these these storms whether big or small are inevitable in life and that's where having a foundation to be able to withstand these storms is so important I, i'm a man of faith you know in in matthew uh 25 7 it talks about having a foundation built on rock and so for you individually you got to figure out what helps you create that foundation in your life that you can withstand the storms whether it's financial storms? Do you have savings? Do you have investments that you can fall back on if financial storms came? Relationship-wise, do you have enough relationship equity built up with your wife, your kids, so that if something happens that you guys can band together? There's so many uh, different ways that you can build this foundation. I believe, and I believe you do as well, based upon the way I see you work in the gym, that by callousing yourself, by making yourself do difficult things each day, I like to do them in the morning to kind of set up the day, that preps you for the other things that are going to be difficult in life that are coming your way each and every day, each and every month, year, whatever it may be, by, by pushing through adversity, by proving it to yourself, that's another way you could build that foundation of rock. I, I love that. And, and I think it's, in some ways, it's cliche, but going to what you said about the gym, I try to make my most difficult time of the day something that I can control, which is getting after it really early in the morning. And obviously, we can't control the next 5, 10, 12 hours down the road. But in my mind, I set myself up for my day by getting after it and, and callousing you know, my muscles and my hands and, and all those things that I can control. And, and I think it's important that we try to do those type of things. And obviously, some people are afternoon gym people or evening gym people. It also depends on where you are in that phase of life. But for me, I always try to get through that hardest point. It doesn't mean that the rest of the day is going to be just snap your fingers and it's, and it's perfect. But I've found that when, when I'm done with a really difficult workout, not only do I feel better, but it's almost like I go throughout the rest of my day, even when I encounter those challenges or obstacles, and I do it with more, I guess, confidence per se. Yeah, I agree 100% with that. And, and, and I'm built the exact same way from a mindset perspective. My buddy Ed Milet would say it could be as easy as taking a cold shower in the morning to prove to yourself that you're willing to do difficult things, that you're willing to make yourself uncomfortable. That's a small win to start the day to kind of just tell yourself, like, I'm in control. No one likes to hop in a cold shower first thing in the morning. But by doing that, and I'm not saying that's the only thing you there's so many ways that you can kind of prove to yourself that you can push through uncomfortable situations but by doing those things repetitively it will prep you for those storms in life that are coming yeah and and i could not agree more i also do a cold shower and i do probably 30 seconds to a minute at the end of my shower but i think you hit it on the head nobody likes to it or enjoys it and and i have a bunch of friends that have cold tubs and and things like that where you look forward to testing yourself and challenging yourself, not the actual idea of, okay, I want to get really cold, you know, especially up here in the Northeast. I don't think anybody wants to really get cold, especially outside at 20 or 30 degrees in the morning, but it's, it's pushing yourself outside of the comfort zone. And going back to what I said is it's dealing with and going through those really challenging moments when you encounter one a day, a week, a month later, I think you almost go back to that replay in your mind where you say, okay, I've been through or I've handled these very challenging things. Doesn't mean that it's going to be simple and I'll get through this 
challenge or obstacle in a second, but I think you give yourself that almost that competitive advantage over the version of you if you didn't do some of those challenging things. Yep. Spot on there, Chris. So interesting question I have for you. Uh, would you rather have more money or more time? Oof. I think with more time, you could earn more money, but I also think you can create time with money. Gosh, that that's a difficult question. I would say in this instance right now, I would say more time. I would love to have more hours in a day. Um, and, and right now, I don't know how much money could purchase that for me. But, you know, I just think about spending time with loved ones. I wish I had a couple extra hours at the end of the day each day to spend time with the kids after they get home from school and sports and before bedtime. I wish I had a little bit more time to be productive in the morning, whether it's workouts or playing pickleball a bunch now or golf or whatever it may be. I'll I'll go with time here. I'm pretty sure I knew you were going to say that, but I think it's a really interesting question because you your your first response was almost like it's that it's both sides of the coin because with more money you can provide more things for yourself for others you can do charitable things with more time you can obviously spend more time with with loved ones and do those things as well but you can also earn more money with more time but you like you said the one caveat to that is you can't earn more time with more money. And I just spoke at a large event last week and, you know, people were talking about the idea of making time versus finding time. And I jokingly, you know, said to someone or to the audience, I said, if anybody has an app that you can show me where you can find more time, please let me know. And then obviously nobody did. And then I go on and said, has anybody ever looked under their pillow or has anybody ever, you know, moved something in their house and be like, oh, I just found another two hours here. No, you make time for those things that are important. So I think it's a really fun question because obviously there's no right or wrong answer. But I also think it depends on what what time you are in your life or what place you are in your life, because sometimes you might be going through an earning phase and sometimes you might be going through kind of that yearning phase where you kind of want to enjoy it. So it's a fun question. That is a fun question. And, and one quick thing, you can't buy time, but I would say for those that are able to, for those that have to travel for work, like I do each weekend, traveling to Bills games, calling the Bills games, media appearance, speaking gigs. If you had a private jet, if you had enough money for a private jet, you you can essentially buy time. You could also bypass some storms in life that the airport and the uh, uh, inefficiency of that process. Uh, you could buy some time in, in lack of stress there. See, and 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 I I agree with that. And and I'd take it one step further. I know some people locally here in the Connecticut, New York area, that travel in the sense of driving to and from maybe an hour or two hours. And a couple of them, what they actually did was looking at their schedules, especially as you know, being you've been up in this area in the past, there's a lot of traffic that sometimes gets, you know, really bad where it turns a 30 minute ride into, you know, 60 or 90 minutes. But some of those individuals have made the decision that they have higher drivers for some of those trips and not from just the monetary expense of it, but it's okay. If I'm going to sit in the car for, for an hour each way. Now, yes, you can make phone calls and you can sometimes listen to podcasts and things like that. But you also, with technology, you can have your laptop or an iPad or your phone and do a lot of work as well. So I think it, it's an interesting perspective that you bring up because I think it goes back to something that I talk a lot about, which is I think time maximization is the new time management. And I've been talking about that probably for the last year and a half now where I don't really feel anybody can manage time. You, you can't slow it down. You can't speed it up. You can't stop it. But what I teach my clients, and especially a lot of the college athletes and teams, it's how do you maximize your time? And I think it goes back to what you just said and what I went on to a little bit with that private plane or getting someone to drive you to and from. It's that same time, but you're just being more efficient and effective with that time, which at the end of the day allows you to be more productive and in essence probably make more money too. Yeah, we could probably fill an entire podcast with this, so I don't (laughs) want to keep belaboring this because I know you have other great material. But when I travel for Bills games, I I save a lot of the preparation for that travel time on airplanes at the airport so that I'm not sacrificing time with my family, friends, other business ventures that I have going, my podcast, my book. I'm not sacrificing that time 
Yes, there's inevitable prep that's going to happen throughout the week, but I'm saving a lot of that for my travel time to the Bills games, understanding that I may get delayed and all of a sudden, hey, that's just extra prep time. And that's a mindset thing for me, which can help tremendously. And I'm with you, that time maximization. And look, as a former pro athlete, our schedules were built for us our entire lives. You work with college teams, you work with college athletes, pro athletes. You understand that these guys operate mainly off a schedule that's dictated for you. Well, you transition out of sport. And if you're not hopping into a normal nine to five, then you have to manage that time for yourself. And this has been a constant learning process for me over these last five years and being able to, another thing for those out there that can afford, let's say an administrative assistant. Well, initially it costs you, it's likely going to take you more time to say, Hey, I need you to book this flight for me. I want you to look for the cheapest flight because I'm from the West side of Cincinnati and I don't care how much money I am. I'm not trying to waste money. I also prefer a window seat if I'm going to be, if it's like a morning flight, maybe late night, but otherwise I want an aisle. I like to, to, to rest on the window, but if I'm if I'm going to be awake, I'd prefer the aisle. So all those things take time, but then in the end, you're going to save yourself a bunch of time. So there's things you can invest time in that then later saves you time down the road. I love that. And, and to your point, we probably could fill up two, uh, two podcasts. I posted something this morning on social media and I actually tagged you in it. I wanted to get your perspective, but some of the most successful people in all walks of life and champions fail. And a lot of them fail more often than others. And I wanted to just get your perspective on on failure and how some of the most successful people also fail quite a bit. Yeah, and, and the reason for that is on that journey to success, there's going to be peaks and valleys, but it's it's often going to end in a peak at your final destination. You're going to be sitting at a point that you can be proud of, but you have to be willing to fail along the way. You have to be willing to take risks. Like if you're financially in a good position, if you want to get to a next position, it's likely going to take a certain amount of risk investing. If you want to get to a a, a different position within your company, it's going to take some risk to put yourself out there and get to that position. But being willing to fail in those moments, to be willing to go out on an NFL football field and expose yourself to the world and possibly fail, possibly give up a sack to where you get booed in front of 70 some thousand people in a stadium. That's a risk you're going to have to be willing to take it. And I truly do believe that the most successful people in like are, are willing to fail. And Sean McDermott would say something to us. Uh, I had Sean McDermott, the head coach of the Buffalo Bills. I had him for my final year with the Bills. And he said, look, we're going to lose games this year. I, yes, we would love to, to to match the 1972 Dolphins and go undefeated, but we're likely going to lose games this year. But we only truly lose if we don't learn. So we either win or we learn. And that's a great mindset to take to anything in life. Okay, I didn't complete that sales call. I didn't get the sale. Okay, why didn't I? Was I unprepared? Was my communication off? Was my delivery off? What was it? that made me fail in this instance, okay, now I'm learning, now I'm going to win down the road. And those that don't go in the tank after a loss, after a failure, those are the ones that are going to continue to learn along the way. And and I was told this recently too, because I felt like, I don't want to necessarily say I've had many things that were failures since my career ended, but I've tried many things. And, And I was told it's okay to quit things. It's okay because our whole life, especially if you've been in sports, you've been taught never quit, never throw in the towel. Well, sometimes in life, quitting things can provide freedom, can provide more time for you to be uh, to devote that to things that you are truly passionate about. So being willing to fail, being willing to try things and then understanding, okay, that was a failure. What can I learn from it? Okay, this doesn't serve me anymore. I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit it. I'm going to say no. And then I'm going to grow from this experience. I love that. And and in regards to to quitting or failure, I think you only quit or fail is if you don't try at all. And and I love how you said, you know, the quitting perspective because because I've been a guest on many shows myself, and a lot of guests or a lot of hosts have asked me, you know, because of the company No Quit Living, Chris, do you really believe that you never quit ever? And and you know. Yes, I have a, a tough mentality and persistence and perseverance. But to your point, 
it's to me it's only quitting or failing if you just never try it doesn't mean that no matter what you just continue to try and whether it's financially all right so now you're you know d- divorced and bankrupt and you have no more employees like obviously there's a there's a point where you have to make pivots and things but it's all about how you learn from that and i think for me the idea of reflection is something that my my personal coach Brian Kane really opened my eyes up in regards to reflecting on those losses or those shortcomings but also reflecting on your wins and your successes as well and i think that's something that that people miss when it comes with the idea of reflection where they think that you only reflect on areas you fall short or losses and yes those are the ones where you can in essence learn the most but for me being in in my position in my field what i do I try to also look back on what went well so I can replicate those things and, and I can duplicate some of the successes. So I think in, re- in reflection, there's both the tweaks, but also trying to repeat the successes. Yeah, I think it's extremely important to re- to have time of reflection because we can very quickly beat ourselves up on the things we didn't do well and forget about the countless things that were getting us to where we wanted to get to on our journey. And correct me if I'm wrong, but when you say no quit living, no quit living is a mindset. It's a mentality you live with. A no quit living is I have this goal. This is the vision I have for my life, for my career. Well, there's things I may have to quit to get there. I may need to quit smoking to get to my health goal. And you wouldn't say, hey, it's no quit living. You can't quit. No, there's things you do have to quit along your journey to get you to where you want to get to. No quit living means I'm going to strive all I can to be the best for me, the best husband, the best father, you know, be successful financially so I can be generous. I want to be extremely philanthropic. I want to be in a great emotional space, spiritual space. Okay. I may have to quit some things to get to that ideal version of myself, but no quit living means I'm not going to stop striving for that ideal spot. Yeah, and 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 I couldn't have said that better. And it's also not, you know, perfect living, you know, nothing but perfection is to get to those levels of success, you have to fail. And it's about being consistent, not not perfect, which leads me into something that I actually wanted to discuss from your book, which is obviously behind your shoulder. But if you guys have not read Eric's book, definitely grab a copy, Tackle What's Next. I obviously, we spoke about this when you were on the podcast the first time. It's a fantastic book. So even if you're not into into sports, you may think, oh, it's just a sports book. Definitely not. It's a it's a book for anybody and everybody that's looking to make those adjustments in their life. But going back to the consistency piece, in your book, you have a section that's titled Consistency Comes from Preparation. And then you shared an amazing statistic about Tiger Woods from the years 2002 to 2005. He faced 1,540 putts from three feet and in, and he made 1,536 of them. So I'm not a huge math guy. So I had to 100% grab my calculator, but that comes out to a percentage of 99.7%. So from 2002 to 2005, Tiger Woods made 1536 out of 1540 three foot putts and in. Would love for you to just touch on the importance of both consistency and preparation. Yeah. And so the amazing thing about that stat is everyone else wanted to figure out why Tiger was so dominant through that stretch. And that was the stat that stood out the most. It wasn't driving distance, wasn't driving accuracy. It wasn't his chipping. It wasn't necessarily even his long putting. But Tiger, when others were buckling and others weren't coming fully prepared to these small wins in their life, in in their game, then he was he was beating them in that area. And over time, that just adds up to so many strokes gained where he could be the most dominant player in the world, the most dominant stretch of golf in history. And so when you look at that and apply that to your own life, it's where are the small wins that you can you can pick up each and every day. And then I would I would encourage you to write those down every night. I had Jason Selk on my podcast and 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 we've become buddies. And he would he says the number one to create confidence in your life is to write down three things at night that were wins from your day that that are getting you to where you want to get to. For me personally, it could be as small as hey, I dropped off the kids at school this morning. That was time intentionally spent with my kids where I'm trying to be an intentional leader of our house 
uh, intentional relationship with my kids. It could be as small as that. But what we do is we lay our, he- our head on the pillow at night and we think about that one thing we screwed up on that day and think the entire day was a waste. And so stacking wins can be so valuable in your own life. And it becomes so much easier to stack those wins when you come prepared for it. And so in the book, I talk about my morning drink, which is super nasty, but it's a bunch of supplements and um, spices and whatnot that have been um, recommendations from nutritionists, from brain doctors to to kind of start your day off the right way. Well, I put all those powders in there the night before because it comes very easy to pour water in, shake it up and drink it. If I had to concoct those every single morning, I might not do it in that moment. I might not be in the proper mindset. Probably similar to you. My my workout clothes are laid out. That becomes a non-negotiable. When I walk into my closet in the morning, my clothes are laid out. That's my outfit. We're getting a workout in plain and simple. And there's so many ways that you can set yourself up for success by being prepared the night before, being prepared for the moment, and then you can take advantage of those three foot putts in your life that ultimately will make you the most dominant version of yourself. I love that. And and I, I take it one step further where I actually take my gym clothes and my sneakers I'm going to wear and I put them on top of my dresser. So there's no excuse. There's no reason why. Well, I'm not sure what I'm going to wear. It's just and I, I get up early. So a lot of times I'm just doing it in in the dark. Staying with the, the golf idea. Have you heard of uh, Ben Crane's three reflection questions that he uses? No, I haven't. So I have uh, I, Ben Crane's a, a golfer, and one of my past guests shared this with me, and I went and did some research. But after every round of golf that Ben Crane plays, whether it's practice or in a tournament, he asks himself three reflection questions. First question is, what did I do well? Second question is, what did I learn? And the third question is, what am I going to do about what I learned? And I first heard these, and, and I remember trying to think the way my brain goes is, all right, what's the most important one? And it's like, all right, the first one, then the second one, then it's the third one. But they're all really important. But what I love about Ben's three reflection questions, going back to something similar that you said, is he focuses on the first question is, what did I do well? Because as athletes or people in general, our first inclination is to look for the areas we fell short or we didn't win or we lost. And yes, it's important to reflect on those as well, but it's super important to also look at the things that went well. Um, so I wanted to share that with you. And then I, I'm sure you, you've you heard of the five to one ratio, which I absolutely love, which is for every one negative comment or remark, you need to have five positive comments or remarks to counterbalance it. And when I first heard that statistic, I was like, ah, I didn't really understand it. But then as a former athlete and a former athlete and coach myself, you know that if you go through a practice and a coach gives you two or three really good comments, but a coach gives you one negative comment, that's the f- that's the first thing you're thinking about, even though the ratio is three to one. So I think it goes back to something you said earlier, the importance and the value of looking at and looking for those wins also, not just only focusing on the losses. Yeah, and I'll say this. If you're a leader out there and you lead or coach individuals that are from – the generation that grew up with social media, they're finding those likes, they're finding those affirmations likely on social media. And so if you come in as a leader and you don't hit that five to one ratio, they're likely going to shut down on you. I experienced this myself and I'm not saying I was so old when I was a captain of the bills and the guy, you know, there wasn't that big of an age gap, but there wasn't social media till I was in college and really not even mainstream until I was already in the NFL. And so these guys that were coming in the league that had it all through high school and their social media blew up through college recruiting, all of a sudden you have this guy who truly cares about them as a captain of the team. But yes, I'm hard on them because I care about them. I want them to be the best player they could be. I want to win a Super Bowl. Well, Immediately, I saw these guys as time went on in in general in, in different draft classes came in, shut down on me a little bit more until I realized the old quote of people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Well, you have got to speak their language nowadays, and you've got to give them compliments to come in and, and just bark orders at them and and break them down. That's that's not this generation. That's no knock on this generation. We created this generation, but they're getting those likes. And so they'll go back to the spot that gives them 
that five to one ratio. I totally agree with that. And I also think it's it's not just what you say, it's also how you say it. And I think sometimes delivering the wrong uh, delivering the right message the wrong way is is the same thing as as delivering the wrong message. So I think there's there's so much in that. I want to switch to what we what we call our hot seat questions. And obviously, you were a guest in the past. You had the the version 1.0. So now we have the version 2.0, and you're actually the first the first guinea pig. So again, same same rules is you just spit out the first thing that comes to mind. And I'm a little nervous about this because I'm a preparation guy. So I came prepared the last time. Uh, I'm I'm interested to see where you go with this. And plus, now we're on video. And so uh, the editing process is not as friendly as I've come to realize with my own podcast. All right. If you could pick any one superpower to have, what would you pick? The ability to fly. (laughs) That's mine as well. Take safety out of it. If you could pick any one animal to have as a pet, what should you pick? I would take a lion. I mean, those those videos of like the people that become friendly with lions, which I don't even understand how that happens unless maybe it was a thing from when they were a baby and maybe they couldn't harm you. But uh, I think that'd be pretty cool. We are literally two for two. So who is your celebrity crush or who was your celebrity crush growing up? So this is a funny story. Well, I would say growing up, it was like the traditional like Britney Spears. She was big when I was maybe like in eighth grade. So um, probably her uh growing up uh she's she's kind of got off the the deep end now but me and my wife had a lesson on celebrity crushes and so mine was Carrie Underwood well i sent her a picture from a super bowl party where Carrie and i were both doing an appearance for a company and i sent her a picture of the two of us very innocent and said hey babe you would love her carrie's great and Larry and Leslie responded back, you don't meet your celebrity crush. You also don't text your wife <laughs> that she's great. And so uh, we don't necessarily participate in that anymore. Yeah, I would say that of what I know about you, that was probably not your uh, your smartest move on that one. Right. No doubt about it. But hey, that, that was a failure, but I learned. No, I was just about to say, you you definitely learned. It was probably uh, a tough lesson for the next week or two. But favorite sound or noise? The sound that gets played on my phone the most would be the white noise because I when I'm sleeping, I got to have some type of white noise. Um, and so that's the one that I play the most. The sound that I like the most is probably the sound of just a flush drive with the new tailor-made stealth driver if it's coming off my club face well you haven't seen me play because i don't ever get that sound cold plunge or sauna i am a sauna then cold plunge guy but if i had to choose one or the other i would go sauna i have an infrared sauna at my house um and this is not a plug i don't own any part of the company but sauna space is a company and i had the uh, the owner of the company on my podcast and, uh, my mom had a stroke and I asked a guy that's super into health and wellness and, and really forward thinking what could help the best. And he recommended this infrared sauna. So I have one at the house and I often joke that besides my family, if I could take one thing with me, if we had a fire, it'd be that sauna. That is is awesome. Favorite ice cream flavor. Black raspberry chip from Graders, which originated in Cincinnati, where I'm from. I found the first thing that we definitely do not agree on. If you could pick one person, one famous person to play you in a movie, who would you pick? I mean, based upon looks, I've heard Will Ferrell, Seth Rogen, kind of the curly haired, fair skin type. But maybe maybe Jack Harlow now. That is awesome. If you could have dinner with any one president, dead or alive, who would you pick? I'll say George W. Bush. We're both members at the same country club, and I've never met him. I'd love to uh, spend a little time with W. That is is also not the answer that I thought you would say. So for listeners that would like to either follow you, find out more about you, also definitely plug your book and your podcast. What's the best way that they can do that? Yeah, on social media, I'm at Ewood70 on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, My website's ericwoodmedia.com. If you have any requests or anything, you can contact me through that website as well. And then uh, my podcast is What's Next with Eric Wood. And I actually have a 
Buffalo football based podcast called Centered on Buffalo, which has been a more of a fun project. What's next with Eric Wood? Likely for this no quit living audience. That's my personal development. That is me getting my weekly coaching. I, I, I worked with an executive coach for a number of years. My coaching becomes that podcast and you get to be a part of it. I'm glad you said that because I've said this so many times that obviously I, I, I love doing the podcast and I've gotten a chance to connect and become with friends with some, some awesome guests like yourself. But selfishly, I feel like every time I interview somebody, I almost, it's like I have a a coaching session with somebody and I, I love that as well. So before we we flip to the last question, I want to ask you if there's something that I should have asked you that I didn't ask you. That's a great question. Uh is there something you should have asked me? Um I don't believe so. I think we got most of it covered between um the two the two there. Um I'm trying to I'm trying to think of something off the top of my head. Um and it's not it's not truly coming to me. Um, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll ask people, hey, what, what are you learning lately? What's God teaching you lately? And, and for me, 2022 and 2023 have been my same like John Gordon. One word has been declutter and that's physical space. Live in a more simplified physical space, emotionally, mentally, career wise. I know I said I added a new podcast, but try and figure out, okay, as time goes on, it's okay to quit some things, to to eliminate some things so you can get more singularly focused uh, on what's most important to your life. Decluttering could be relationships that just don't serve you anymore, but I feel like lately especially, I've been kind of digging into what exactly is going to occupy my time moving forward, especially having a five and a seven year old, we're getting into sports and dance and, and all those things, you know, it's the, the free time becomes less and less. And so figuring out exactly what serves me. And and I'll say this, I am full on addicted to early morning pickleball, which has been a great workout for me. We play a high paced version of it. I say version we're playing the sport, but I'm playing with pretty good athletes and so it's a great workout first thing in the morning in the competition for me. You know, I know you work with a, a bunch of athletes, man, when you get out of sport and for me, I didn't quit playing sports till I was 32, almost 33 years old for a while to not have a competition, you know, almost daily in my life was, was a void that I had. We'll have to uh, play at some point. I played basketball and tennis in college and obviously pickleball is is very similar to to tennis. We'll have to uh, have to play at some point. And the last question I have for you is the same question I ask on every episode. If you have any parting words you'd like to leave with our audience today, yeah, just by even tuning in to make it through thirty five minutes of this podcast, you're on your journey. You're you're where you need to be right now. We talked a lot about not beating yourself up through this podcast to to stacking wins that and, and keeping track of those wins. So my parting word would be. This was a win. Whether you're listening to this in the car in your commute, whether you're listening to this on a walk, a workout, whatever it may be, whether you're just doing housework, this was a win in your life because whether my words served you or not, you are intentionally trying to be a better version of yourself. And that in itself is a win. Mm. I think that's a perfect way to end today's episode. So for our audience out there, if you are not following Eric on social media, make sure you do grab a copy of his book and check out not one, but both of his podcasts. And I know that we will connect again soon. And thank you for jumping on here again. Yeah, my pleasure, Chris. Anytime. Thank you for listening to episode number 388. I really enjoyed reconnecting with Eric, and I hope you took a bunch from what he shared with us today. Whether it was a Kobe story, mindset, the storms of life, we touched on numerous topics. I would definitely recommend that you follow Eric on social media, and if you're looking for a new read, you can check out his new book, Tackle What's Next. In his parting words, Eric encouraged you that by listening to this podcast today, it was a win and you were intentionally trying to become a better version of yourself. I would like to echo those exact same words. By investing in yourself, you are putting in the work, and I commend you for doing so. 
Now keep going and continue to invest in yourself daily. And remember, we rise by lifting others up. And lastly, to our listeners, thank you. We truly appreciate your time, and we hope our episodes inspire you to keep on attacking life and never giving up. To quote Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, it's always too early to quit.